All right. Well, I think we'll get going today. Um, I'd like to thank everybody for participating in our fall Ontario chapter American Fisheries Society webinar. I'm, I'd be happy to thank uh, Dr. Jack Stanford for giving a talk at the title Ecology of the Last Great Wild Salmon Rivers. Um, Jack is Professor Emeritus at the Flathead Lake Biological Station at the University of Montana, where he has worked since 1972. He was the Director and Spearman Professor of Ecology from 1980 to 2016. Um, Jack has graduated 14 PhD and 28 master's students and has published over 220 scientific papers and books on ecosystem processes and influences of human activities. Um, Jack has received uh, the Award of Excellence with the Society of Freshwater Science in 2004, as well as in 2011, and received the Lifetime Achievement Award of the International Society for River Science. Uh, his current work focuses the ecology and conservation of Pacific Rim Salmon Rivers, and he is a board member of Skeena Wild and the Wild Fish Conservancy. And with that, I'd like to welcome Jack and give the floor to you. Okay, <clears throat> Brian, thanks a lot. <clears throat> Excuse me. So all of you out there, I'm very happy to share a little bit of my experience with uh, rivers around the Pacific Rim. I will say that I've also worked on rivers in Norway and uh, particularly in South America. So what I want to do is rather contrast the wild salmon rivers of the North Pacific Rim with uh, some of those rivers. I particularly want to talk about a concept that is called the shifting habitat mosaic. The idea is that river systems are interconnected from their headwaters all the way to the ocean and that Anadromous salmon obviously take advantage of that, uh, spread out their life cycle through freshwater and marine environments. And the basic bottom line of this talk is that rivers that have a very dynamic habitat complex, called the shifting habitat mosaic, tend to be the rivers that are most productive of salmon and and um, biota in general. So for starters, since a lot of you, I think, work on rivers that are uh, tributary to the Great Lakes where salmon have been introduced and really proliferated quite well. The same thing has happened in, in South America. I particularly worked on a river called the Rio Grande, which is in Tierra del Fuego. And that's what you see in this picture here. It's a fairly simple river, not a lot of riparian at all. And historically, the German brown trout was introduced into this river system in the 1920s and 30s. And for about 30 years, the fish remained resident. They didn't migrate to the ocean. And then, uh, after they had consumed most of the small resident native fishes, which were all small, small fishes, they became what we think was food limited and began to go to the ocean where they found great forage and came back as really large fish. Today, there are about 40,000 of these big browns run brown trout coming back to the Rio Grande. And Yet, there is one tributary, the Hermanita, that's shown in this picture here, where they're still just resident. Um, and so our hypothesis was that the Hermanita, Hermanita must be more productive, have more food in it than the rest of the system. And sure enough, that's what turned out to be the case. Fish are resident where they have plenty of food and they're anadromous where food is limited during the juvenile portion of the life cycle. And gradually, the anadromous form of, of the sea run brown trout has taken over that system. 
and will eventually probably take over the hermeneticite as well. The point of showing you this is just that salmon, salmonids in general, are highly adaptive. They can really take advantage of local conditions. And it's very strange that we would have so much trouble in the, in the Pacific Rim where they're native in keeping them going. All of, most, all of our populations around the Pacific Rim are declining. They're in numbers or in adult body size. And most of our thinking is that it's not freshwater that's causing this. It's a combination of changing conditions in the ocean, over harvest, and particularly the influence of overstocking with hatcheries. So with that as background, understanding that these fish are really plastic and able to adjust life cycles to low conditions. In other words, they're very much um, place-based. Their life history characteristics that they display are very place-based, and that's linked to this dynamic environment that we call all the shifting habitat mosaic. Here's a picture I'm going to talk quite a bit about rivers in Kamchatka, Russian Far East, and this is the a picture taken quite a long time ago of the Krutogorova River in central part of the Kamchatka Peninsula on the on the west side, on the Sea of Ohosk side. And this picture to me represents what a great salmon river looks like. Big, got complex environments. Here you see a big scroll bar um, forming as it erodes on the right, deposits on the left. And the vegetation is, is high on one side and low on the other in relation to the age of the trees that are involved. And all through that riparian vegetation are small channels that house uh, juvenile fish, great juvenile fish rearing area. Pool area in front of us here in the first part of the picture is <coughs> a, a staging area for migratory uh, salmonids. And then, of course, the riverine environment on the right. So you can just kind of keep that picture of these dynamic habitats in mind as we go through this talk. Uh, that's, that's what I want to really focus on. Channel positions are always jumping around. And um, as floods occur, channel may convulse and shift around. And uh, you get a, a relationship like this in just about any river system in the world in the world that has uh, a, a large amount of alluvium that it's moving around and a very dynamic riparian forest, get these habitats that uh, are constantly changing. And the biota has to adapt to that. And the salmonids are particularly interesting in the way that they take advantage of this dynamic interconnected habitat from fresh from the very top of the watershed uh, to the ocean and probably the same sort of thing exists in sort of different format uh, in the ocean and <clears throat> this whole idea was summarized in the mid 2000s by a paper that was sort of pub published in a remote place but it's cited all the time and this particular diagram has been used over and over and over, but it underscores my point. Rivers start in the headwaters basically as spring channels, and then they coalesce into uh, a larger into larger stream, and somewhere along that montane pathway, it's going to run into an area that's graded, and the river has a chance to spread out and develop floodplain. And that goes on downstream all the way to the ocean, that theme. So geomorphic setting is in play here along with climate. But the main process is cut and fill alluviation as wood and sediments are moved around and plant succession constantly uh, putting new wood into the scenery. <clears throat> now, a fundamental characteristic of this kind of environment, especially where there's rubble bottom or gravel bed streams is <clears throat> ground and surface water interaction. Groundwater or river water will be downwelling in one area, 
and then upwelling after passing through an alluvial aquifer and upwelling in another area. And the biota take advantage of that. In essence, um, the entire floodplain from valley wall to valley wall is underlain by a, an alluvial aquifer. And in, in this context, that entire aquifer is uh, what's called a hyperreg zone or an area of, uh, of <clears throat> the floodplain that's housing groundwater organisms. And this movement of water from the surface to the subsurface and then back to the surface again is fundamentally driving the way in which uh, various life histories of the biota are organized. We know as an aside here that there's a group of organisms, including some large body stoneflies that live entirely their larval life cycle in the groundwater. And then uh, there are also uh, phreatic organisms or true groundwater organisms that migrate from the phreatic zone into the hyperreg zone. And occasionally where it's upwelling strongly, uh, carry out large volumes of crustaceans uh, and other organisms that provide great forage for uh, salmonids and other fishes. Now, all of this can be modified by various animal interactions, particularly in the case of this talk, uh, beavers. So my point is that the great river systems, salmonid river systems of the world are, are the ones that are really hugely productive are characterized by expansive uh, shifting habitat mosaics that exist from headwaters to the ocean. And this can be elaborated in a bigger way, particularly for sockeye salmon, if some of these areas uh, along the river corridor uh, are large lakes, which the sockeye are particularly adapted to take advantage of. So let's get that, uh, that sort of uh, construct in mind as we talk through some examples of big, great river systems that remain where wild salmon are, are doing really well. And again, I'm emphasizing wild fish here as opposed to uh, cultured fish or introductions where uh, salmonids have elaborated, such as in the Great Lakes or in South America. I'm talking about the rivers around the Pacific Rim same applies to Atlantic salmon in their native habitat, but that's a little bit of a different story because of the pressures on them are a little different than what we have in, in uh, the Pacific. But uh, just about everything I have to say here do, uh, does apply to, to uh, Atlantic salmon uh, rivers as well. Now, this whole idea of a shifting habitat mosaic has been taken by uh, Daniel Schindler's group, the University of Washington, to a a new high, and this ha this paper in Science, which was just published, to me is one of the greatest salmon ecology papers ever published. It shows how salmon in the Bristol Bay area are utilizing the shifting habitat mosaic to maintain one of the most productive wild salmon rivers in the world, and it remains intact, largely intact. The point of the paper which they were able to make by sampling the otoliths or the ear bones of salmon that they collected at the bottom of the basin. In other words, right where the river uh, goes into the ocean, they collected <clears throat> adults returning and found their, or uh, dissected out their otoliths and then looked at both growth rates by the number of growth rings and also where they were uh, in the basin at different age Classes. And to summarize it quickly without going through the whole paper, you see this figure here where for sockeye in 2011, they were over on the Tikchik side of the base primarily. And then in 2014, the distribution shifted way over towards the Mulchatna side. That's that shifting habitat mosaic moving around and the fish taking advantage of it, following it around and utilizing it to maintain a very stable population of sockeye. One of the surprises here is that a large number of, of um, sockeye are being produced in riverine environments rather than in the lake environments. 
top panels are about Chinook, bottom two panels are about Sockeye. But for the Chinook, you can see how they were on the Tiktik side, then they moved to the to the Mulchatna side. Mulchatna is a famous Saka or a Chinook salmon or King Salmon River. And uh, this dynamic allows the Bristol Bay system to be one of the most productive in the world. And it's dependent on this interconnected suite of habitats that's highly dynamic over time. They're adapted to that, and that's what they need. That's what makes the Bristol Bay area so productive for salmon. It's also important to point out that uh, owing to this natural resilience um, <clears throat> uh, and, and uh, careful management by the Alaska Fish and Game, this population, these populations in Bristol Bay haven't been over harvested. System is able to keep pace with the harvest, and we have year after year a portfolio of life history types of each species across the entire Bristol Bay system that sustains commercial fishery fisheries over the long term. In the in the Columbia system, just as a contrast, or even the Yukon now, uh, harvest has trumped the ability of the shifting habitat mosaic to keep up productivity and the numbers of fish returning to the commercial fishery and to the subsistence fishery are declining. So to elaborate this, I had a project that started in the mid-90s and is just concluding now where we examined the most pristine rivers we could find around the whole Pacific Rim in the context of what it, what, how productive each river was for salmon fishing. And what were the characteristics that identified those that were uh, in great shape versus those that were uh, really hurting? Comparing the restoration rivers down in the area of Washington and Oregon to uh, British Columbia rivers, particularly the Skeena, was a focus along with the Kitlope, which is a very beautiful river in, in totally intact in the Great Bear Rainforest south of the Skeena. And then a couple of rivers in Alaska, and then our rivers in Kamchatka. I'm going to particularly talk about the Utolik River and the Coal on the Kamchatka Peninsula in the context of how Rainbow and Steelhead, same fish, how rainbow steelhead have adapted to the different characteristics of those two rivers. And then we'll, we'll add some other uh, tidbits of information about uh, how all of the rivers compare in terms of salmon productivity. But the theme here for the next few minutes will be, what's it take to make a steelhead or a rainbow? Are they the same fish? Yes, they are. They interbreed in our life history types spawn together in the Utolik and the coal. And um, I always taught my students to be ready to take advantage of a lucky break. Something would happen in one of these rivers because there's so many complex things going on. Uh, don't focus so much on the fish, just be prepared to uh, see something unusual. And this young woman, uh, Audrey Thompson, got a big steelhead in her hands there, but she had the wherewithal to notice that not only were salmon migrating into, into the, uh, into the uh, coal, or er, into the uh, Utolik River, but early in the spring, there was this upstream migration of these amphipods. These are marine amphipods, and she took this clip, film clip of them migrating upstream in huge numbers, and every one of them is a uh, female that's full of eggs. What they're doing is carrying those eggs way upstream, where they dumped them in, in May, in early May, through May, and then gradually fell back 
towards the estuary. These are marine amphipods that are able to move into uh, fresh water and spawn. It's just very much like the uh, salmonids that come into this. So here we see the numbers of amphipods in the river bottom uh, in May, almost none. And on into June, almost none. All the while this uh, migration is occurring and the eggs are being dumped up to 50 kilometers up into the watershed. And so by July, early July, there are hundreds many hundreds per square meter of small amphipods on the bottom of the river. And this is the time when the salmon are spawning and dying, leaving their carcasses in the river, and the amphipods are just chewing up those carcasses at a very rapid rate. I won't show you the data, but they just eliminate the carcasses really fast. So their life history is timed to the deposition of spawning by the salmon, and gradually their numbers decline. Why do the numbers of amphipods decline as the carcasses disappear? Well, for one thing, they're maturing into larger organisms that can then migrate back down to the estuary. But this is the period when the juvenile salmon are emerging from the reds and growing very fast, and they're feeding abundantly on these amphipods. So it's the, it's the predation on the amphipods by the young salmon. It's pulling the numbers down here so that by September, they're back down pretty nearly where they started. See, this is a strong interaction then between a marine species, uh, two marine species that uh, are utilizing fresh water. And they're interacting with each other, the amphipods providing essentially marine nutrients to the salmon and the salmon providing green, green nutrients to the amphipods. So my point here is just that it's always complex out there, and it's complex in the physical environment and the way in which the organisms interact. Now let's contrast the river where the amphipods, they're, they're actually in all of the Kamchatka rivers. They're notably abundant in the river on the right there, or the Utolik River. And contrast that with a more complex river system, a bigger system, like the coal on the left. Coal River is an amazing small river. It's not huge. It's, um, what could I say? It's compared to, oh, uh, a river that's 50 to 75 meters across in the main channel. But notice this river, the coal, has a tremendous floodplain and lots of different river channels in that floodplain. And if you walk underneath the, the riparian canopy, which are willow trees, there's this sub, sub uh, understory that is up to 12, 15 feet high when it's mature. See my student there in the, in the understory, the Russians call this Shalomanyak. And uh, it's essentially a, a huge, uh, a huge layer of, very nutritious, um, edible plants for, for insects and all the way up to bears that grows up every year from tubers in the riparian soils underneath, underneath the riparian zone. See our camp there on the, on the river that we built with funding from the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. Thank you very much. And in the coal, we have only resident micas or rainbow steelhead, only residents for the most part. In the Utolik, the other river, the more simple river, less physical complexity, the rainbow steelhead group is entirely composed, almost entirely composed of steelhead life groups. So it's sort of like the story from Sierra Fuego. There's so much food for big fat rainbows in the coal from the spawning salmon, up to five to 10 million of them coming back to that little river every year, that they just eat salmon eggs, salmon flesh, and all of the residual, or all of the associated organisms that, that uh, make, take advantage of the salmon runs, and things that fall out of this riparian forest. 
the carbon to nitrogen ratio is off the wall, owing to the marine subsidy by the decomposing salmon. So it's the same species, rainbow steelhead. In fact, in the coal, we have a number of smaller utolic-like streams that flow into the coal or are near the coal. And the uh, rainbow and steelhead life history types spawn together. So what you have then is a, in the coal is a big, pretty good sized river system, not huge, but a, a big one. And there's some, some anadromous species coming in all through the summer, even under ice in the spring for lampreys and under ice in the fall for some coho and some steelheads. So there's a constant uh, se segregation of the runs coming in. And so there's some segregation in spawning time and where they go in the river system. And that's all facilitated by the physical complexity, biophysical complexity of that river system. And when they, when the huge runs of salmon die off, it's a huge subsidy. All the carcasses on the shoreline and uh, caught in the riparian vegetation, uh, summer, late summer floods carry all of this material into the riparian system where it's incorporated into the riparian uh, forest. So in the spring, when the, when the snow melt occurs, the amount of nitrogen that's available in the system, is all total nitrogen, jumps up as the alluvial aquifers are flushed where it's accumulated, fertilizes the river in the spring, and then that, that subsidy is gradually pulled down by plant productivity, both in the riparian forest and in the stream, until the spawning run comes, and this, this river system is dominated by pink salmon, and two different years are di di diagrammed there, but the result is the same both years. The spawning salmon refertilize the system and pick the nutrient, the nitrogen, other nutrients up, spread it very high again. Then gradually it begins to decline. The point here is that the marine subsidy is driving this system. This is a very poor nutrient system from the standpoint of what the watershed itself is contributing. But because of this huge subsidy from the, from the spawning salmon, the river system overall is enormously productive. Uh, and the, the carbon to nitrogen ratios in this understory, this riparian forest, is off the wall. Just compare the temperate broadleaf Nyack cottonwoods to Nyack is our floodplain without salmon in Montana that we've studied extensively. The point is that the green subsidy is really fertilizing the system. And in a way, the coal is so productive relative to what we're used to seeing in US and Canadian streams because of the dramatic reduction in the number of fish that come back owing to commercial harvest. Sam the salmon rivers in Kamchatka owing to complex geopolitical relationships haven't been harvested very hard over the years. But our salmon on the U.S.-Canadian side have been uh, harvested up to about 80% rate in many places. And that's playing into the ability of the shifting habitat mosaic to keep up productivity, resilience of those salmon now, just a little bit of geomorphology to illustrate some points. Those point bars, like the one I showed at the beginning of the talk, form as shown in this picture here. And the movement of water in the channels and also exchanging with the alluvial aquifer is mediated by the formation of these, of what we call a typical ridge and swale topography. Uh, some Wood is deposited in the middle of the stream that catches uh, sediments and begins to form an island. And eventually, the island attaches to the uh, to the um, shoreline as, as the river moves from the erosion side to the deposition side. And eventually, you have some swales there. And, and even uh, during flooding, the swales can become flood channels 
And during base flow, those flood channels, because they scoured out uh, at, say, for example, picture at point number eight in the far left, far right uh, uh, picture, uh, actually become a spring brook. And that, that's a spring brook that's it's inside the riparian canopy. So it's a tremendously great place for juvenile salmon to rear. And it's all driven by this complex interaction that is listed in the bulleted points on the, on the left there. So ridge and swale topography in alluvial floodplains is one of the characteristics that makes a great salmon river. Show you this picture again to hopefully bring that point home. There are a lot of salmon, juvenile salmon, living out in that riparian forest. It's fertilized by the salmon run. And there are insects in that forest that are feeding on the plants, and they fall into the spring channels and feed the little fish. Plus, the spring channels are driven by outwelling groundwater from the alluvial aquifer and uh, feeding the juvenile fishes as well. And it turns out that different species of salmon do different things in this complex environment. They, they, hack, they sort of hack their own territory out and they segregate a bit. But we find all of the species to some abundant level, some abundance level in every habitat in that, in that picture there. And for the rainbow steelhead, this results in a wide variety of life history types. The top one here is a full-on anadromous fish, and the one on the very bottom is a full-on resident fish. Now this picture is, or this diagram is in Russian, uh, plain in Russian language, because this was worked out by my Russian colleagues at Moscow State University, and they've won some major prizes for this work, showing that the rainbow steelhead complex is one complex of life, life history types that's very evident even on the scales, which are shown on the left there. Anadromous fish growing very rapidly in the ocean, resident fish growing very comparatively slower, staying in fresh water, and then a bunch of inter several intermediate types that are uh, reflected in the scale growth rates. To summarize this, it's just a full-on anadromy, uh, or it can be a what's called an adramus B, one that doesn't go clear around the uh, end of the Kamchatka Peninsula and out into the Bering Sea. These are stay a little closer to shore. And then there's variants where there's estuarine, ones that just live in the estuary, and ones that uh, don't go to the ocean at all. And this is all driven by uh, this sort of crapshoot or the way in which these particular life history types have used the complex, the complex environments that exist in the river system. But, and here's the key that is not often understood by biologists working on the U.S. and Canadian side, that they all spawn together, that gene flow occurs between all of these life history types, and that's reflected in the otoliths. Here, the green is freshwater and the blue is in the ocean. What we've done, looked at the strontium calcium ratio in the primordium of the otolith, the first layer that's laid down ear bone uh, of the fish. And if that ratio is uh, fairly high, it means that the mother of this fish was anadromous or had spent some time in the ocean. If the strontium to calcium ratio is relatively low, as in the green boxes, say the one on the top left, that fish never left fresh water. The one on the left near the bottom stayed in, was born in fresh water and then went to the ocean. 
So this, all this variation in life history types is driven by the way in which the fish sorted out the environment that's highly dynamic and interconnected. I hope you can all follow that. The result is that there's a very, quite a bit of variation amongst river types in Kamchatka in terms of the, the, the dominant life history type. The immensely complex rivers, like the ones in the middle there, middle part of that diagram, have all the life history types. Whereas the Tolik River, which is uh, from the top, is mostly uh, anadromous because that river system is relatively poor in food and the, and the fish have no choice but to go to the ocean. Whereas in the big, uh, big rivers like the Coal, which is the last, the bottom one, um, it's mostly resonant fish, but there are a few typically anadromous fish even in the Coal River because we have a number of brown water side tributaries come into the lower part of the Coal. For the most part, they're resident owing to the huge salmon run. And then you have the variations that, um, that uh, occur uh, intermediate to those two. Interesting. So we have then the most productive rivers around the Pacific Rim occurring in those systems that have big, expansive floodplains. And the importance of free-flowing spring channels can't be overemphasized. This picture, this is from the Quithlip River in Alaska. Yellow shows all of the off-channel environments available, but not all of it's free-flowing. And in fact, it's difficult for the fish to move around because of the dams made by beavers. Now, you typically hear about beavers being very much associated with good fish production. Well, yes, fish will grow well if they can get in the beaver dam, into the beaver pond. But if they can't move through those big dams, or it doesn't flood efficiently, carry them in, and they can't necessarily get out, they may not do as well in systems where the off-channel environments that I've emphasized in Kamchatka are so bloody productive. These kind of systems here, beaver free spring brooks, really producing a lot of fish because they can move in and out and they can move from side to side and go all the way to the headwaters where the ground um, where the groundwater is upwelling and carrying good food supply to them. Beavers kind of mess that up, but beavers and salmon in North America evolved together, so um, they've learned to deal with uh, the fish have learned to deal with the beavers. You can put it this way: sometimes the beaver giveth by finding finding a providing a very able pond to live in, or sometimes they take us away if the access to those environments, particularly in the late successional beaver pond, is limited. So to kind of sum up, summarize the story that we found looking across all of the different kinds of habitats and in all the different rivers that we studied around the Pacific Rim, we found that there's quite a bit of variation in the different environments that make up the shifting habitat mosaic but all of them are providing some amount of productivity. What's a little bit more interesting to me is that the Russian rivers were much more productive in terms of numbers of juveniles density per meter squared uh, than the North American rivers. I think this is less a reflection of lack of complexity in the North American rivers than it is just simply the legacy of harvest over the last hundred years. We've sort of over harvested our North American rivers. Kamchatkan rivers are still hanging together and producing up to, producing densities up to five, six, seven juveniles of all, this is all species now, but juveniles, this would be mostly, so, mostly sockeye, coho, and 
Chinook uh, uh, in in the different biotopes that occur in those Russian rivers. So to elaborate this, we looked a little closer at the comparison between a North American river, uh, the Kwitluk, which is on the bottom left of this picture, and the Kohl, which is one of those Western Kamchatka rivers, one where our camp is, on the top uh, uh, picture panel. And the colors show you the area or the abundance of off-channel environments, particularly spring channels. That would be uh, spring brooks where groundwater is upwelling, forming a channel in a, in a swale, in a flood channel, and providing one of those can over canopied uh, streams that are connected to the main channel, allowing for both spawning and juvenile rearing. Lots of it, lots of it available in the cold, and even more available in the Queefleck. These are a some somewhat similar sized rivers. But note how much of the Queefluck environment is red. That means it's blocked by abundant beaver dams. And through tagging studies that we did, showed that the movement of juvenile fish back and forth from those environments is really low. They just can't get in and out of those systems. So in essence, the comparison of the Queefluck, where beavers have always existed, and the coal, where beavers have never existed. There were never any beavers ever in the history of the Kamchatka Peninsula. All of those environments, all of those off-channel environments are connected to the channel with no obstructions, and the productivity is much higher per unit area. It, the bottom line is that the coal is producing 5 to 10 million salmon per year, and the Queefluck is producing at best 100,000 or so. Now, this is a bit of a spurious comparison because we know that the coal is receiving a huge marine subsidy compared to the Queefluck, just by virtue of the numbers of salmon coming back. And the numbers of salmon coming back are greater in the coal than they are in the Queefluck because of the legacy of harvest. So harvest over the, over the uh, last 100 years or 80 years or so has really begun to limit the number of spawners that are coming back. And this is a, a problem in the Queefluck. It's a tributary of the Kuskokwim River, big Chinook River, and um, it's showing signs of extreme problems, and the Alaskans are pretty worried about that system. Even during the period of our study, the numbers of returning Chinook declined dramatically during our study, mainly because of harvest. Now, just to bring this idea of complexity and how physical complexity and how it relates to overall productivity for a number of rivers. These are the tributaries of the Kuskokwim. It's a big river, with, and these are all good-sized, good-sized tributaries. And all of them have uh, counting weirs, weirs on them, allowing the numbers of fish, uh, numbers of Chinook returning, to be enumerated. And over the long term, this relationship exists. Most productive of the Kuskokwim tributaries for Chinook are those that have highly complex channel structure, like the coal, Kamchatka, the Kisarolik, and Kwisluk, really complex floodplain river systems, and they're producing a tremendous number of fish. Uh, this system also produces a large number of riverine sockeye, uh, similar to what I described Bay. But you see the relationship here between physical complexity measured by the number of stream nodes. A node, a stream node is where uh, a channel comes together or separates. Um, so a river system with an anastomosing geomorph uh, geomorphology uh, would be at the top of the figure, and those with uh, uh, more of a simple or constrained channel would be down at the bottom. 
So we looked at this for the entire Pacific Rim. Where are the most complex river systems? And here they are uh, done with remote sensing. These are for uh, catchments over 1,000 square kilometers. And the uh, most complex systems are in Kamchatka and in some parts of um, British Columbia, Crystal Bay. Interestingly, some of the North Slope rivers, and the same for the Kotka Peninsula in, in Russia, are also extremely complex, but they are also extremely cold, at least up till now. In fact, the Vernarktok uh, River, which is shown uh, as one of the bases there, is fairly complex, but some of the others are even more complex, but the Sag freezes solid every winter, except for the very spring heads at the head, in the headwaters. So most of these rivers have been historically way too cold to support salmon. But guess what? As the, as the ocean temperatures have begun to rise, pink and chum salmon have begun to colonize even these North Slope rivers and all the way around into British Columbia uh, into Canada via the via the McKinsey system. I think I think all five species are now in the McKinsey, or may have been in the McKinsey for quite a long time. The Noatak River is also uh, showing very very dramatic increases in some salmon. That's uh, river number 32 uh, in this figure. So there's a, a a description then of those systems that have the most complexity. Now, when you link that to the likely future scenario in terms of flow and temperature, which we modeled, and then put the complexity together with the likely future of flow and temperature, it's possible to rank these rivers in terms of uh, habitat quality or, or potential productivity uh, from high to low. We also added in another variable, which very much data, which is the which is the human footprint. So dams, diversions, urbanization, so on and so forth. And so the southern part of the range is really in poor condition. No big news there. But it shows that there's still large areas of the world where of the Pacific Rim where salmon should do well if they are managed in a place-based context that emphasizes maintenance of the linkage between habitat shifting around and life histories adapting to that. This study also pulled Columbia River out for de detailed analysis, and it shows that even in the Columbia River with all the dams, there are some parts in the middle Columbia and the upper Columbia that are going to be holding together in, in terms of, of habitat quality, at least in this analysis. Whether or not the corridor leading to those blue colored streams is packed enough to allow uh, resilience in the salmon population remains to be seen, particularly because we know that harvest and hatchery problems are pervasive in the Columbia system and are contributing to probable overstocking of the ocean. When you add the United States and Alaska, United, the main Oregon, Washington, Alaska hatchery operations to the tremendous number of hatcheries on the Russian side and the Japanese side, that the numbers of pink salmon in the ocean now from cultured source stocks are beginning to overwhelm the wild stock. Good evidence of that coming out, which I could summarize for you. But my point here is that with proper management, we should have salmon, wild salmon, in the last great wild salmon rivers in Kamchatka in the north part of Alaska and in some places in British Columbia, particularly the Skeena and the Stikine systems, into the future. So that's pretty much what I wanted to talk about.
talk to you about today or what I thought I would talk to you about today. We could go on and talk a lot about other species that um, are dependent on salmon, uh, the bears being the most talked about ones. And we've done some very interesting studies on the relationship between timing of salmon coming back to, for example, Kodiak Island in Alaska, where there are large numbers of very large bears and also in Kamchatka, where there are even more numbers of very large bears, and why that's the case, versus other rivers that have fewer bears, and uh, some of the details about how the bears have adapted to follow the life cycle of the salmon. Um, that's interesting stuff that would be fun to talk about, but I won't go there today because I've already probably talked longer than I should. I'll leave it with you, though, that um, there's always something that can be elaborated by linking river ecology in detail to life history variation amongst the organisms that are living in those rivers. Sometimes um, there can be situations that get a bit out of hand, but if you're careful about how you work around these organisms, they'll, they'll be good. Well, Brian, uh, I think that's how far I wanted to go with this. I hope you all were able to hear me. Um, you could contact me if you want any of the papers that uh, I've alluded to in this talk or others, or if you have contrasting uh, information relative to your experiences in the, particularly the Atlantic salmon world, uh, I'd love to know about it. So thanks for listening and good luck to you. Uh, thank you so much, Jack. That was great. Um, I guess if anyone does have questions, they can type them into the, the chat bar on the right side of your screen. Um, I guess we'll give people a minute or two if there are questions. Um, otherwise, while we're waiting, um, also just to do a plug for the Ontario chapter AFS. So um, we try to host uh, seminars both in the spring and fall of every year, in addition to our AGM, which is a, a two-day conference with lots of talks from professionals as well as students. Um, and if you're not a member, we certainly encourage everyone to become a member of the chapter and support all the great fisheries work that's being done in Ontario and um, as well as our partnering um, provinces and states. Um, and it doesn't look like anyone has any questions. Um, so I guess if anyone does have anything, um, either it can forward um, questions to myself, and we can pass those along to Jack or via Phil at Credit Valley, and we can get those to Jack. And um, Jack, if you're um, willing to share your PDF of your talk, we can post that on our website as well for people to reflect upon if there's a lot of information to absorb the last 50 minutes. Sure, that's fine. That's great. Thank you. Um, I guess with that, uh, thank everyone for participating, and thank you again, Jack.